Happy Little Games. This video was requested by longtime Patreon supporter Fat Chris. Thank you so much for your support. Arcade gun games hold a place near and dear to my heart. I can recall standing on a chair and having my dad holding it steady while I played Monster Gun shooting anything I could. There was something oh so cool about holding that pistol, rifle, or Uzi and taking care of any threats with a single pull of the trigger. Once arcade technology started to evolve and more and more elaborate gun games would come along, I made sure to try each and every one at least once. Some of my favorites growing up were Duck Hunt, Crossbow, Lethal Enforcers, Point Blank and yes, even Mad Dog McCree. Today, we are going to talk about a certain shooter that was mired in controversy from the get-go. This Uzi-wielding dual-screen action extravaganza thrilled arcade patrons both young and old. The name of the game is Operation Thunderbolt and it was released by Taito in 1988. What real-life situation was the premise behind this arcade game? Why was this arcade game censored in certain parts of the world? So lock and load and get ready to kill all the bad guys because this is the history of Operation Thunderbolt. The year is 1987 and development has just started on a little game by the name of Operation Thunderbolt. Before discussing the game at hand, we have to go back and take a look at its predecessor which was released in mid-1987 which was Operation Wolf. Operation Wolf was designed by Tomohiro Nishikado, whose early arcade works included designing the massively successful Space Invaders. From the ground up, he wanted to create something that was completely different than what he had done previously. He was a huge fan of American action films and this was the mid-1980s and Steroidomania was running wild. He was looking to create a large and in-charge shooting game unlike any that had come along before. Arnold Schwarzenegger was looking to pump you up or blow you up. I lied. And his line of action movies were the perfect inspiration for his new game. Operation Wolf sees you assume the role of Special Forces Operative Roy Adams as you attempt to rescue five hostages who are being held captive across six enemy locations. The game uses an optical controller which is built inside of a gun assembly which is very similar to an Uzi submachine gun. Since the gun is mounted on a square base, this allows players to swivel and elevate the gun. A motor inside the casing simulates the recoil effect when the gun is fired. You also have a button on the side to throw rocket bombs. The game was absolutely bonkers when it was released and any shooting game fan immediately fell in love with it. The graphics were large and detailed with an insane amount of frantic action on the screen. The sound effects and music were also memorable, including voiced intro, cutscenes, and ending scenes. Any red-blooded American felt like Rambo after grabbing hold of that Uzi for the first time. The game was a massive success for the company, which caught Taito by surprise, forcing the company to bulk order extra memory chips for the increased production of the arcade cabinets. When it came time to develop the sequel to Operation Wolf, the reins were handed off to young designer Junji Yurita. 
The only requirement that came from the bosses at Taito were the simultaneous two-player aspect, as well as making everything bigger, badder, and better. They also wanted to increase the number of levels in the game so that more quarters would be spent. Mr. Yurita wanted to keep the same style of game with you having to rescue hostages and kill everyone in sight. For the game's storyline, he decided to pull from a real life situation, which was the 1976 incident known as Operation Entebbe. But it's also known as Operation Thunderbolt. On June 27th of that year, an Air France Airbus jetliner with 248 passengers had been hijacked by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine External Operations. This maneuver saw commandos rescue 99% of the hostages with very few casualties. Mr. Eureta felt this would be absolutely perfect for his game, which would take the familiar left and right scrolling gameplay but also at an over-the-shoulder viewpoint which makes for some fine and dandy sprite scaling. Operation Thunderbolt made its debut in the arcades in 1988. As the story goes, a group of terrorists have hijacked a plane filled with Americans and have given authorities 24 hours to release certain terrorist prisoners. If their demands are not met, all of the hostages will die. Due to the successful handling of the mission Operation Wolf in South America the year before, the CIA calls in Roy Adams to save the day. To make sure the day is saved, they also enlist fellow Green Beret Hardy Jones due to the size of the operation. After the game had been on the market here in the States for about six months, an updated version was released which censored the game by removing any and all mentions of real-world countries and organizations. Due to the censorship of this title, all references to the Green Berets were removed. This means that Roy goes into action again, but this time with just a standard fellow by the name of Hardy Jones. This mandate came down from Taito America Corp, which did not like the fact that the plot of the game was too similar to the actual Operation Entebbe. This game is a one or two player on rail shooter which takes the basic premise from Operation Wolf and cranks everything up two or three notches. From the start, you'll notice there are many more soldiers and vehicles on screen than there were in the previous game, making it much more difficult. It does make sense though that the difficulty would be increased due to it being a co-op game. Even though in two player mode you fought alongside your teammate, you can still compare each other's hit percentage to see who actually had the best shot. The game takes place across eight levels in which you have to shoot all of the enemies and vehicles in your path. Not only do you have the massive power of the Uzi machine gun in your hand, you also have the ability to throw rocket bombs. You have a health bar which, quite obviously, will deplete the more damage you take from various enemy antagonists. As if bobbing and weaving from left to right avoiding the enemy fire wasn't bad enough, you also have the various hostages to worry about. There are 18 of these pesky individuals who thought it was a good idea to vacation right in the middle of a war zone. Be careful because if you accidentally shoot a hostage you will lose a lot of health. It's also imperative that you rescue as many hostages as you can so you get to see the good ending. The enemies are crawling out of the woodwork, blasting you with their guns as well as throwing grenades and even trying to kill you with a knife. Certain enemies will also dangle from the ceiling thanks to their many years of performing as a trapeze artist. Apparently, these danglers were also trained in the art of gluing their hats to their head. The other big addition to the style of gameplay was the first person 3D style stages in which you are running like a madman down the streets blasting away with your Uzi. You can also be driven in a jeep and also a nice relaxing cruise. 
This is a good change of pace and you really appreciate the smooth scrolling and scaling of the roadside objects. Similar to the first game, various objects and party packs will drop from the skies including gun magazines, rocket bombs, health power-ups that give you either a partial or full refill and more. Sometimes you have to shoot pigs or cats to uncover these power-ups. The hostages are a much more varied bunch this time around including random bald man with a camera, generic female hostage, WWE's Paul Bearer, as well as a pilot of the plane, Donald Trump. The enemies come in all shapes and sizes with an overabundance of the color purple. Rumor has it the enemy terrorist raided Prince's wardrobe before coming on this mission. In addition to the regular enemies you have to dispatch, there are a couple of mini-bosses including a blonde Arnold Schwarzenegger ripoff as well as a rocket-firing general. Similar to the first game, this features fully voiced cutscenes in between each level. Raid the Clapple. Got ammunition and jeep! As I mentioned, the game features eight stages of machine gun blasting action. The stages you will encounter are Gathering Intelligence, Ammunition Raid. Searching the bunkers. Rescue hostages. Heading towards enemy headquarters. Rescue hostages part due. Securing escape routes. And the last level, which is the plane. There are a total of four different endings in the game, with the worst ending being if you fail to rescue at least one hostage on stage four or stage six. The bad ending, which occurs if you reach the cockpit but accidentally kill the pilot being held by the hijacker. The good ending, in which you manage to defeat the hijacker without killing the pilot. And then finally, the best ending in which you save the pilot and rescue all 18 hostages. Escape successful! Mission completed! Your operation was successfully completed. Now we can go on R and R. Don't let's go with 
orders for your next mission will be given. When the game was released, it shot to the top of the charts, but it didn't have the staying power as its predecessor did. Ocean Software were once again put in charge of the home computer conversions, which I will get to in just a moment. One strange but totally cool cameo that Roy Adams had was in the arcade version of Camel Tribe. The marble in the game was replaced with Roy's disembodied head. Roy Adams would also make a small cameo in the arcade game Palamedes. He also made an appearance in the Japanese arcade game Quiz Quest. The only home console version we received was the Super Nintendo version, but that wasn't released until 1994. The gameplay itself remains pretty much unchanged from its arcade big brother, but the storyline has been fleshed out quite a bit. The story now revolves around General and President for Life, Abul Bazaar. He is also the warlord of the Bentazi People's Republic and, rumor has it, the People's Champion. His demands are that his imprisoned comrades from France and Germany be released and he will also release the hostages. You have a grand total of six playable characters to choose from, each one having different attributes such as firing rates and capacity of the magazines they use. Of those six characters, Roy Adams and Hardy Jones are nowhere to be found. Each of those six characters also has a different death scene. All eight levels were transferred over and for the most part look pretty good. The scrolling isn't as smooth and neither is the scaling of the sprites, but it's very playable when you consider the different control options. You can use the standard Super Nintendo controller, the Super Nintendo mouse, or the Super Scope 6 light gun which seemed to work pretty well back in the day. The character sprites are large and detailed, but there is a lot of flicker going on at certain points. The speed of the game is a bit on the slow side, even though there are not as many enemies on screen. Something else that is a bit slow is the pointer when using the Super Nintendo pad. Since the story has now been fleshed out, there are a lot more cutscenes to be found, although there are no voices. This is a fine little conversion, but I'm curious how Operation Wolf would have fared on the system. There is a bit of censorship on the first level with all religious imagery such as the crosses on the church being removed. When the Commodore 64 version was first reviewed in the magazine Zap 64 issue 57, it was given glowing reviews. The screenshots that were shown in the magazine looked great, adding to the 92% rating it received. When Commodore users finally got their hands on this title, they could tell something was amiss. For some reason, Zap 64 reviewed a version that was only 50% complete which wasn't even playable and little more than a slideshow demo. After the initial programmer was given the boot, Paul Hughes, one of the many talented programmers at Ocean, confirmed that his team had 12 days to create the game from scratch in order to meet the deadline. This is why it ended up looking so different than what was previewed. So while it's an amazing feat that we received anything even remotely resembling the arcade game, the bottom line is the game just isn't very good. The perfectly balanced gameplay that was found on the 64 version of Operation Wolf was nowhere to be found. For starters, there is no on-screen crosshair so it's pretty much impossible to see where you're aiming at unless you look closely at the ground for missed shots. While the graphics on the 64 version of Operation Wolf weren't exactly Katy Perry, they did get the job done. These graphics are a pixelated mess with an overabundance of brown and gray. 
The 3D sections are very choppy and the on-screen enemy count has been drastically reduced. This game allows you to use either a joystick, mouse, or light gun, which unfortunately I never got a chance to check out. All of the graphics were ripped out of the cutscene, so everything is text only. The sound effects, and in particular the music, are really good with some nice chest-pumping tunes to get you raring to play. It's hard to judge this title as you would a typical Commodore 64 game. For only 12 days, it turned out rather well. Overall, though, it's not quite up to snuff. Sticking with the 8-bit line, let's take a look at the Spectrum conversion. Operation Wolf turned out pretty well on the Spectrum, but this one attempts to buy it off more than it can chew. Operation Wolf found the right balance between not too terribly difficult, but not too easy either. Which is exactly what my wife was going for when we were dating. The sprites on Operation Thunderbolt are very detailed, that is if you can actually see what's going on. The actual in-game graphics are purely monochrome, but at least there isn't any color clash. Because the arcade game upped the difficulty at every corner, the programmers felt they should do the same here. And boy oh boy did they ever. As soon as the game starts up, you are assaulted by four or five soldiers and two or three helicopters all at the same time. The speed of the game is fast, almost a bit too fast. Aside from a brief intro tune, there is no music and we have to be subjected to a long series of exasperating queefs. Something else that they failed to do this time around is include a crosshair indicating where you are firing. The controls are responsive, but the game is just way too difficult. In terms of overall presentation, the 128K version even includes the cutscenes in between each level. This is the only 8-bit version to do so. Amstrad version is up next and look at all the lovely colors. Now that we have a little bit of color in our life we can actually see what's happening on screen. This is basically the spectrum port right down to the number of enemies on screen and the popcorn sound. The speed of the game is very close to the arcade original but again it's just way too hard. The GX4000 version should have been so much better considering how good the CPC version turned out. The bright color palette is gone with everything having a murky tint to it. When I was playing this conversion it felt like I was wearing my sunglasses but I'm pretty sure I wasn't. There are a few changes such as the upgraded HUD but overall this is the exact same version as found on the CPC. The Amiga version is coming in hot and all in all it turned out rather well. Programmer John Brandwood was the genius behind this version so kudos to him. The large detailed sprites from the arcade game have been translated over although there aren't as many enemies on screen at once. 
This was a conscious decision by the programmer as he felt the game became unplayable with too much action on screen. The side-scrolling sections move along at a nice steady pace, but the 3D over-the-shoulder sections aren't quite as smooth. This port offers the full arcade experience with fully voiced intro, cutscenes, and ending scenes. The sound effects are perfect and this was achieved by the developers sampling all of the sounds straight from the arcade board due to the PCB's test mode and that includes the whimper that the animals make. I've been playing this game for 30 years and I still feel bad every time I hear that sound. The music was done by Jonathan Dunn and it fits in perfectly with the rest of the package. The developers put in the option of using either a joystick or a mouse which worked out quite well especially for co-op games. The mouse control is the best way to play in my opinion but it's still missing the on-screen crosshair. The only negative I can see is that the colors aren't as vibrant but that is a minor quibble. This is utterly fantastic especially back in 1990. By the way, if you need more of a challenge from this version, there is a cheat that will enable more enemy sprites on screen. Succeeded in rescuing hostages! And last but not least is the Atari ST version. This is very similar to the Amiga, although the scrolling is not quite as smooth. All of the voice clips and sampled sound effects made it over, although they are a bit grainy. The music has also taken a big hit. It still retains the fantastic playability found in the Amiga version. Now if you don't like messing around with emulators and setting up the game for mouse controls, the best way to play it at home is on the Taito Legends compilation for PlayStation 2, Xbox, and Windows. And there you have it, the history of Operation Thunderbolt. The series would continue with a couple of more titles including a brand new entry in the franchise coming out later this year. Just like Wolf before it, this is one of my favorite games to play in the arcade due to a number of factors. The big bad Uzi that you get to use, the fast and frantic gameplay, and the gorgeous visuals. If you've never had a chance to shoot some animals all while blowing up the enemies to hell and back, be sure and give this game a shot. You'll be glad you did. Once again, this video was requested by Fat Chris on Patreon. Thank you, my friend, for being a longtime supporter of mine. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. If you would like to contribute but not sign up for my Patreon, you can always click the donate button up above. Thanks everyone for watching.